Before we can generate contours on a map like this, we need to understand the concept of break lines. A break line is the intersection line between two topographic surfaces of different slope. This manila folder is a good model of the land on either side of our stream. The two halves have a different slope and they meet at the waterway which is the crease. Using our plotted points we start to draw our triangles. For clarity on our paper model here we have two different colors and you'll see lines that cross the break line. Those are not drawn lines. In this case, they are steel wires passing between those points. In fact, you'll see that those wires in 3D space are above the crease or the break line representing the stream. Now, this creates a problem because that line in 3D space does not represent the land surface where the stream is. So if we use this to interpolate contours, it won't give us contours that make sense for our stream, which again is a break line. A break line is the intersection of two surfaces of differing slope, just as we have at our stream. Therefore, the triangle sides in our triangulated irregular network must not cross a break line. The network shown here satisfies this rule. Along the break line, when we collect measurements in the field, we collect elevation and position where the break line changes direction or if it changes slope. Thus, depending on the irregularity of the break line, the spacing may be larger or smaller than the spacing for other topographic survey points. Before we start interpolating elevations along our triangle sides, we must first interpolate elevations along all break lines. Then we will connect with triangles between break lines and other non-break line points. So let's apply that to our map here. You can see we've got a high point here and there is a stream flowing this way, there's a stream flowing this way and this way and this branch flows this direction. We've got another high point and then this one flows this direction. Between here and here I have a total of eight feet of fall because I don't have any other elevation information between those two I have to assume that there is a consistent slope between those. So I'm going to go ahead and say all right I've got eight feet. I'm, if I divide that in two I've got a four feet of fall. So I'm going to put that at halfway. So four feet of fall uh, from 56 would be 52 feet. Well I can split that down and say okay this is fi a 54 elevation and roughly here would be 50. So I'm going to just make an approximation here and say that all right that's probably also 52 feet there. Well between this point here and 61 that's a difference of what nine feet? So let's figure that out. Uh, if I go nine feet I can divide that into thirds first and I'm going to estimate that that would be about a third and this would be about a third. So a third of nine feet is three feet. This would be 55 and this would be 58. And I don't want to put too many other marks on there to keep from cluttering up my drawing. And from 61 here down to 54 that's a fall of seven feet isn't it? So if I kind of split that is four feet and three feet. I think 58 would be right about there, wouldn't it? One more time, if I go between 56 and 45, that's 11 feet. So if I make it six and five, I think right there I'll have 50 feet. That's 
dividing my 11 foot fall into a 5 foot chunk and a 6 foot chunk. Okay, well given that, now I can draw more lines than I would have otherwise had. I'm going to treat the stream as a break line. So let me draw these lines. Well, here's what it looks like when I get my lines all drawn. So now I can apply the same principles we used in the previous video, and now I need to interpolate elevations along each of my triangles. And it will help for me to interpolate a few more elevations along the break lines because I'm going to create five foot contours. Here's what it looks like with all the elevations interpolated along my triangles and along my streams. So let's then think about drawing contours. Now this one is going to make use of the fact that the V's that cross streams point upstream. So let's just start with one of those to help you understand. For instance, here we've got the 50 contour crossing the stream here, and I haven't labeled everything, but you can see that this has to be the 50 contour. See that? Okay. And we'll see a little bit more of that um, momentarily, but let's also start with things that we know are going to be easy. You probably figured out we've got a high spot up here in the corner, and when we connect all these lines, then you can see pretty much a cone shaped hill developing here, right? Okay, I just drew the, the 60 contour here, and let's start talking about the 55. Now the 55 is going to cross this stream right there and right there, but it's not going to connect through. Watch this. Then it comes back around here. And it's going to cross this stream too. And it's going to come back out right there. You see how that works? All right, well, that gives a little more meaning to what's happening. Let's then take a look at the 60 contour since we're in this vicinity. The 60 also will cross the stream. Notice it keeps getting closer and closer to the stream here as we go. And then it comes through this. And we don't have any information, enough information to, to be real honest. I, if this was my survey, I would have collected more information, but it's not. So we're using what we have. But then this comes over here and Yep, there's a place where I forgot to interpolate something. So that's going to be about it's going to be about right there is the 60. Okay. There is the 60 contour. Okay. Well, I think you can see what's happening with the 55 again here. Notice it's also going to form a V but it's pointing up toward this saddle. Okay, and the 50, it looks like my spacing isn't quite as good as I'd hoped. There's the 50 doing that right there. Okay. There's 65 down here. 
Notice it can't connect to this 65. Why? Because there is low ground between there. All right, well, I'm going to go back up here and think about the 65 here. Okay, this is 65. Okay. Now watch carefully here. This is 70. Then 75 comes and loops around this guy here. So I've got a ridge extending from upper right down toward the lower left here in the upper right quadrant of our map. Now let's look at what 60 does. We know it's going to have to cross this stream up in here somewhere, isn't it? So here's 60. It's going to come over and do this. And here is 55. So because we had a high spot here at 61, well, you can see that the, uh, the streams flow in opposite directions. All right, the, the bottom right corner might look a little tricky. Let's, let's trace the 65 contour now. Here's 65, and then 70 comes through like this, and then back off the edge of the, the bottom edge of the drawing, and then I've got a little summit here at 75 surrounding this elevation where 76 is, and then 65 slices right across the corner of the drawing. Let me clean this up so that it's easier to see the contours now. So here is the final set of contours with all the other uh, extraneous marks removed the best I could. This fits the rules that we've established early on for the creation of contour lines. The V's, where they cross the waterways, point upstream. Lines, in general, run parallel to each other, as you can see in the upper left quadrant on that cone-shaped hill. We have two ridges, one at the upper right, uh, that has a peak elevation of 76 and another one with a, a local peak down in the lower right as well. So hopefully this has been helpful for helping you understand how we generate contours when we have collected our data on an irregular spacing on the key features of the landscape.